All right, I'll do my best to remember everything. And yeah. anything I don't remember, I'll just lie about. So. Okay, that's fine. Well, you're a storyteller. That's what you do. <laughs> Beautiful lies. That's all it is, right? There uh, you go. All right. Um, ready? Absolutely. Let's dive in. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Renegade HPG podcast. I am very excited today to be joined by Michael Stackpole, one of the founding fathers of the Battletech universe. Michael's Warrior and Blood of Kerensky trilogies were both pivotal in laying the foundation of the early lore. Mike has been a stalwart contributor to this universe ever since, and his novels has consistently guided fans to the most pivotal moments of Battletech history. We'll be talking about that journey today with a special emphasis on the early days of the IP and the formation of this universe that we all know and love. Mike, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Oh, I am happy to be here. Awesome. So I got so many notes and, you know, I was thinking I, you know, I've had a chance to talk with Blaine and with Bob so far and kind of Blaine kind of, you know, picked up steam kind of in the middle of the Battletech history and is, and is doing a lot now. And Bob was kind of focused in the early part, but you've, you've been there the whole time. So it's like challenge to like, all right, where, where do we want to focus? There's a lot, there's a lot to cover there. Yeah, there really is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's start kind of at the natural place. Let's you start at the beginning, you know. So you were there, you know, right at the start, you know, with, with uh, writing the Warrior Trilogy. You know, how did you initially get con getting connected with Fassa and, uh, and Jordan, you know, back in those early days? Um, I knew those guys sort of tangentially because I was in the gaming industry. Uh, and when you're in the gaming industry and you're working on the selling side of the tables, uh, you know, it's kind of like being a carny with a state fair. Uh, you know, you, you just, you, you get to know these people, but it's always in a different location. And back in, uh, 86, I had written a novel, uh, and I, uh, so I, I thought, wow, I know how to write a novel. And, um, I, uh, went to the guys at FASA and I talked to Jordan, as a matter of fact, and said, uh, you know, I've, I've written a novel. I'd be, you know, I, I see you guys are doing novels because the first of the Grey Death Legion books was out at that point. I think it was Decision at Thunder Rift. And I remember the, the you know, Jordan, the look on Jordan's face was, was understandable uh, because it was, oh God, not another game designer who thinks he can write. <laughs> uh, and so what, what Jordan actually talked to me about was, um, uh, they had Renegade Legion upcoming, so maybe I could do something for that. This brand new IP, but they went ahead and sent me a whole bunch of stuff. And this, uh, what we had talked was at Origins, which was in uh, beginning of June in uh, uh, in that year, and uh, by uh, uh, Bastille Day, the the fourteenth of um, July, uh, a big box of stuff had arrived from FASA. And it was all this Battletech stuff because they had no, they didn't have any of the Renegade Legion stuff, but it was kind of a, see, we really are interested. And they sent me all this. So I spent the weekend just pouring through it. And I had mailed off to them a disc that had, uh, I think the first six chapters of this fantasy novel I'd done, uh, which was a novel Italian Revenant and a, uh, a, a, a GEV Ogre, uh, short story that I'd done that Steve Jackson had published uh, in Space Gamer. And uh, that Monday, I get a call from Ross Babcock, who's uh, Jordan's partner uh, in the business. And, and um, uh, you know, Ross said, hey, we got your novel. Uh, we got the first six chapters, enjoyed it. I'd like to see the rest of it. And I'm a freelancer. And, I, and I'm saying, hey, that's great. Be happy to send that off to you. Uh, and by the way, uh, I got, uh, you know, I got the big box of stuff and I've, you know, I've read through just tons of it. If you, you know, and I've got a few ideas for stories. So if you ever need anything from Battletech, let me know. Cause as a freelancer, you're always caging for work, right? Of course. And, and Ross says, that's what we want to talk to you about. We want you to write a trilogy. All right. <laughs> okay. And then and I'm going, okay. And he says, yeah, you got nine months and this is one of those moments in, in your mind as a freelancer where you're going, if I say no, I get nothing. If I say yes, I actually have to do it. So my response was, sure, piece of cake. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we went from there and that was, and that was pretty much it. And, and that was the Warrior Trilogy. Um, and I actually got it done in, I think, 10 and a half months. Or, uh, yeah, 10 and a half months. Uh, because they had me write something else in the interim. Uh, so so you had a little excuse there. <laughs> awesome. 
And, um, and a lot of the kind of that warrior trilogy, you know, and I, I talked to Bob and it's, it's funny when you mentioned kind of your, your first contact with Jordan, cause Bob had a very similar experience where Jordan, he kind of approached Jordan. Jordan was kind of like, Hmm, I don't know. And, and yeah. it was like, Oh, okay, we can do this. Um, but, um, but yeah. Um, and I, and I, and when I was talking to Bob a lot, I, I kept kind of, you know, prodding to kind of get an idea of kind of how the collaboration happened between, you know, those early writers, you know, between you and, and Bill Keith and, and Bob and, and Robert Thurston a little bit later. Right. And I, I started to get the sense of how little actually collaboration there was there. I don't know if that was just Bob's perspective, but uh, it was it was really incredible to me. So maybe if you can kind of take me through your perspective there, because all of that early lore fits really well into each other. And so, you know, it seems like there was a lot of communication going on back and forth, but from Bob's perspective, there wasn't. And so I'm curious in terms of, you know, for you and getting your stories cohesive with the other novelists that were working at the time, what, what was happening there? What was kind of allowing, you know, for that, that end product to come out the way it did where, where things just really fit well into each other? Well, the, the, you know, the initial, the, the warrior books, um, FASA told me roughly what was going to be going on. Mm -hmm. And they left a lot of the details up to me to kind of develop as I was going. But the warrior novels were uh, what I've taken to calling umbrella novels. Uh, and I tend to be the guy that's writing the umbrella novels mm -hmm. that are covering the vast amounts of, 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 of activity. And then everybody else, whether it was game product or it was other novels, were writing sort of within that developed area. Now, you know, Bob, we, I think we would have loved to have brought in for a lot more creativity, but that guy is so talented and is doing so much other stuff. Yeah. You know, there was, there was yeah. a limited amount of time right. um, that we could bring him in. So things devolved um, into a program where every three years, and this started um, when we were looking at doing the 20 year, 20 year jump that, uh, FASA would have a, a summit meeting. Uh, they would fly me into Chicago. They had their staff there. They would bring one or the other of the writers in um, to try and see where we're going to be going with the universe and, and how we're going to get there. Um, and I remember on the 20 year uh, leap meeting, which was the first of these, um, you know, I was sitting there. It was, it was pretty much me and the staff. Uh, you know, so Jordan and, and uh, I mean, just everybody, Sam and, and uh, Ross and, and uh, uh, some of the artists and the continuity guys, whoever the continuity guys were, you know, working at, at that time. Um, and I remember there was one point where we weren't sure if it was going to be a 10-year leap or a 20-year leap. And I had done genealogies of who had done, who was going to be doing what. And I remember saying, look, if it's a 10 year leap, I can find characters and we're going to be okay. If it's a 20 year leap, we got a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And so that pretty much decided, okay, it's going to be a 20 year leap. Um, you know, the idea about the clans, uh, uh, Fassa and Jordan had the idea about the, the clans and, and what was going on. And I remember uh, in uh, 88, uh, Jordan and I were walking around at the Gamma Trade Show in uh, Las Vegas. And we were just chatting about all this stuff. And I think I was, I had just finished uh, Repost and Jordan was reading it. He was about halfway through. And I mentioned that, you know, with, with Morgan Kell, there had been a mention of the, you know, the Red Corsair and, and they're going out there. And I had told Jordan, I sort of had guessed, uh, or I'd sort of thought about, you know, that there must be some areas where there's still technology or there must be some things that are going on. And this led him into talking about what they were thinking about doing with the clans because they were going to be doing the virtual world centers at the time. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted uh, that modular mech technology to use in the, in the battle pods. Yeah. Uh, and literally as we're walking through the show and we're talking about all this stuff, that's when I looked at him and said, Oh my God, they're not wolf dragoons. They're the wolf dragoons, which is, <laughs> which is basically the same thing that went through, went through, uh, 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 went through Phelan's mind in the end of uh, Lethal Heritage. Um, but it was right then that, you know, I think both of us realized, okay, yeah, this fits. We can make this work and make it all click. And so, uh, you know, we had that first meeting. So this, that would have been in, uh, in March, February, or February, March uh, would have been when Jordan and I were walking around. And then, you know, it was early summer or probably actually about April, I think, 
when we had the meeting in Chicago to, to figure out the 20 year leap and, and go from there. Um, and that was the, and, and what would happen and the way the pattern was set up is every three years we would have a meeting to decide what we're going to do for the next five years. Okay. So you, you, and then every yeah, like year that. at Gen Con, um, we'd have a meeting with all the developers or people who are going to be doing source books and other product. So we tell them what, you know, what their piece of this was going to be. So we had a general plan, but obviously as we're working the novels and as we're working all this stuff, things need to be adjusted. So every three years you plan for five uh, and then you, and then you go from there. And, and just depending upon what writer was going to be, was going to be available, what writer was going to be, uh, was, was taking over stuff. I mean, when Lauren Coleman started to do more, Lauren got invited to one of these meetings. Uh, you know, the meeting for um, Twilight of the Clans. Uh, it, the, it was, uh, uh, wasn't Bob, it was um, uh, Bill Keith. Bill Keith was the other writer uh, who was there. So it was Bill, me, and, and, and the staff. Um, and, and look, I, I was very, very lucky um, that they trusted me enough and valued my input enough to keep me involved all the way along. Yeah. Um, and, and one, cause I enjoyed it. And two, it made it real easy for me to sort of set the world, to be able to tell the kind of stories that I like to tell, you know, a lot of politics, a lot of warfare and stuff like that. So, right. so it's, it's just been great for me. And that's why I continue to continue to work with it just cause it is so much fun. And when you're, when you're coming from your stories, I'm always curious, kind of the, the kind of the, the vector that, um, that authors come in for their storytelling of whether you, you kind of sit down and, and you have your, um, your characters and you have an idea of the setting and you kind of build the story forward as you go, or do you come through with a rough outline of kind of moments and, and themes that you want to put into the story and then kind of build the story around those? Um, generally speaking, and this is true for when you're working in anybody's property, um, you'll have a, you'll produce an outline. You as the writer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some properties uh, they'll hand you a relatively extensive outline already or a bunch of wants and needs and ideas, and you get to imprint those to a certain extent, bring other characters in and stuff. Um, with FASA, it really took more of a, uh, more of a hands-off approach in terms of we would know that certain things need to happen on a certain world. Yep. Okay. And, you know, so we, we could say to Blaine, you know, Northwind Highlanders, You've got a world, go. But mm -hmm. these things have got to happen. You know, um, and, and like a really good project, oddly enough, was on the Shadowrun side. Um, there was, uh, uh, I think it was Into the Shadows. It was a, uh, an anthology that we did really, really early on that had a single plot line running through it. And I wrote about the last 30% of the book, but other authors came in and wrote all the interstitial material coming up. And there we were able to say to them, look, Shadowrun World, knock yourself out, but this thing has got to happen in your story. Okay. You know, this building has got to blow up. Whether you see it from afar, whether you are the one who blows it up, we don't care. This has just got to happen. And so, and, and that is, that's very much the, 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 the feel that we got. And then what that really let us as authors do is that if we got a cool idea, if we got a possibility of, oh, wouldn't this be slick, then, you know, we were able to, you know, go back to FASA and say, hey, we may want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's when, uh, and, and if it checked out, they would then contact the other writers and say, okay, guys, you know, this is something which is now a fact. Uh, in the universe. Literally one of those I was writing and I forget which novel it was. Um, uh, but I was, I was uh, writing about Thomas Marek and we were about to do the reveal on Thomas Marek being someone else um, or, or the fact that Thomas Marek was, was, um, was alive. And instead it became this, this was the moment of what if Thomas Marek is not actually Thomas Marek? Okay. Uh, and, and, and that ended up spinning off a whole spur of story, as, as well you know. That was never part of the original thing. But that morning when I sat down to write that chapter, 
suddenly it was like, oh my God, if this is true, then it makes for a whole different setup in the universe. I called Sam Lewis. Sam Lewis called his continuity guy. We hashed it back and forth. I'd looked up any sources I could. We all agreed there was nothing to say that Thomas Marek was or wasn't Thomas Marek. Yeah. Uh, and so all of a sudden we could go off and play with that. And that really um, makes the universe very, very dynamic. And that's what made it a lot of fun working with, talking to other authors, collaborating back and forth. Definitely. And for, for those broad strokes, where were those coming from? Where are those something, you know, Jordan and, and Ross are doing, you know, in terms of, you know, what the, I guess the, the spine, you know, of, of the lore that you guys were building up, like who set those, like this happened, this happened, this planet, whatnot, you know, where'd that well, come those, from? The, the, the general concepts that, that sort of fit the umbrella novels, um, those were things that we would come up in the meetings, uh, come up at the, at the, at the five-year meetings. Uh, come up with the summits. Um, the specifics, for example, the way that that the uh, succession war went in the in the warrior books. Um, you know, I was the one that figured out what the waves were going to have to be, where we were going to have to hit, what was going to be wave one, wave two, wave three. Gotcha. Okay, because that was um, that was just part and parcel of what I was doing. Right. Um, you know, in the middle of, I think I had finished on guard and we were going to repost and, and uh, Jordan gave me a call because it was around December. It was literally, he was calling from the FASA Christmas party uh, and um, told me, oh, by the way, we need some Comstar stuff in there. You know, think about doing this. Okay. So, you know, boom, it gets added in. And there was, there was enough room and flexibility to do that kind of stuff as they mm -hmm. had other ideas. But rarely did I get a phone call saying, oh, by the way, you have to chuck this in. Right. And, and kind of on that Comstar, I was, I was talking with Bob of kind of the, uh, the uh, I guess, the rebirth of Frederick Steiner. You know, and so, you know, can you give us a little story about what your inspiration was for kind of bringing him back in his, uh, his uh, you know, incarnate, you know, Comstar personality? Um, we knew that, it, you know, Frederick was, a, Frederick was, an, was, a, was an interesting character. Um, he was a, uh, he wasn't the person he should have been. Uh, and I think we felt that, that, you know, him with a near death experience would kind of have an epiphany and, and, you know, going on in him as, as he gets rebuilt and re in, and gets inculcated into what Comstar is, you know, his whole sense of duty and, and things that he had growing up as a Steiner, you know, kind of get moved over, but he's also got this, this purity and lack of ambition to it and sees his duty as the things he, he must do. And then he gets put into that position where he's got to be in charge of saving the inner sphere, which is what I think the old Frederick Steiner would have loved to have done. But for him, it would have been with him as, as first Lord, you know, with him running the whole show. Right. Uh, and now it's stopping the stuff that would destroy everything. And that's a quantitative, quantitative shift in how he looks at the world. And you get that after you have his experience. So. Awesome. awesome. And, and kind of talking about kind of those, or going back to the introduction of the, of the clans and, and between, you know, your introduction to them in uh, the Blood of Kerensky trilogy and then uh, Robert Thurston's introduction through uh, Way of the Clans. Um, what's, um, you know, kind of what was the balance there in, in terms of developing what the culture of the clans were and what they represented? And, and it's, it's cool to kind of hear you tie in what Jordan was doing with the pods, you know, and their need, which was simply a technical need and programming of creating, you know, essentially the Omnimac technology. But I'm, I'm curious kind of between, um, between you and Robert in terms of, you know, defining what the culture was and, and kind of presenting that, you know, to the fan base through your novels. Sure. When, uh, uh, when we had agreed that we were going to do the 20 year update, uh, one of the things they tasked me, doing was writing the development document for the clans, mm -hmm. you know, so I wrote the document that was the core of their history, um, how they, how they broke out politically, uh, you know, what their names were, who was missing, you know, all of these, uh, all of these things. And I think that was a 10 or 20 page document. Um, you also have to remember at that time, 
Thassa was publishing their own books, but they cut a deal with uh, Rock uh, to start publishing both Battletech and Shadowrun novels. So there was a question as to whether or not the Blood of Kerensky books would be the first books in the uh, in the in the Rock deal, or if they uh, because they were ready to go and Rock wasn't ready to go, uh, or whether we would then start the clans, uh, focus on the clans to start the Rock line. Okay. So what ended up happening was that my books stayed with FASA and and FASA published them. Um, so Bob Thurston had presumably that development document, was able to look at my books, was able to get more stuff out of FASA as they had uh, line developers and other people writing source books. Right. Um, so it, it did start from sort of a, um, a cohesive, in the meeting, this is the idea that we have about the clans. And then they kind of left it to me to flesh the details out. And once I sent the details in, that's when you know things began to be shifted and then as I was writing the novels and having to develop a lot more of the nitty gritty of the culture as we go along, everybody who's doing source books and that stuff is pulling that material out to, to have it there. And, and that's not unusual at all for a, a just developing a novel and developing a property is that it, it's a cycle. You know, you start with right. the source material, you're doing more and that forces you to do things They go into the source material and so it goes just forever and ever and ever. Definitely. And then when you were writing Blood of Kerensky's, you know, how far out um, in the in the timeline uh, had kind of the benchmarks been laid? Like what what was the end of the history that you knew of? You know, was it Tukia, beyond Tukia? Like kind of what, uh, you know, I guess, what were you writing with foreknowledge of there? Well, we knew that we knew that the, the clans would have to be stopped. Mm -hmm. OK, so we knew, you know, everything that went into uh, Blood of Kerensky, we knew that was going to happen. Um, we hadn't dealt with the uh, repercussions of that on the clan side at all. Gotcha. You know, okay. we, we really weren't we really weren't having any visibility there, mainly because we were having to write from the point of view of the inner sphere, because the inner sphere was what all the players uh, already knew. So that's where we had to come from. So, you know, for the, I think it's kind of an interesting thing that for the, uh, for the readers who just picked the books up in science fiction, their focus was on, on the, uh, was focus was on the clans, you know, cause you got the, the Jade Falcon trilogy and then you get Bob Charette's book. Uh, and then I think, um, uh, uh, I forget the title of it. Well, you get one of mine. I think it was number five in the in the in the uh, natural selection. Yeah, yeah, natural selection. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get that. So so for anybody who's just picking them up as rock books and and seeing them as science fiction, their approach to the universe was entirely reversed from uh, yeah, the right. way that, the way that the people who were diehards and were following it all the way through had gotten it. Yeah. Uh, but that certainly it seemed to hold together. I mean it. it there weren't any difficulties of people going, Hey, what's going on here? Right. And, and you have to remember that FASA was always using, had always perceived the novels as a marketing tool. Mm. The idea was to get the novels out there and draw people back to the game products. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it was a, it was an interesting thing because back in those days, the storyline would drive what was going to come out of the product line. Uh, and that was really exhilarating for us. And, and you know, obviously we had a, uh, a, you know, an arrow of time and momentum telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, when things shifted over to the click-based stuff, because those were being sold as collectibles, um, it ended up being what was going to be released as product would begin to drive the story. And that, and I, I must admit, I had a little bit of difficulty with that. That was kind of freaking me out. Yeah, because uh, I I didn't have it. I I didn't feel that I had as much leeway as I had had before, right. and the novels weren't really as grand when we were doing the Dark Ages novels gotcha. as they were when you're we doing the Umbrella novels otherwise. And I'm curious, you know, um, for your characters, you know, and because you know, 
the farther you move in, the, mo the more contributors you have to the novels. You know, what is it like either writing characters that other novelists have really, you know, invested, you know, you'd say it's their, their character versus, you know, seeing the characters that you've invested in developing and seeing them in other people's writing and kind of how do you, you know, kind of how do you perceive that? How do authors kind of, you know, what is, what is, I guess, the, you know, the unspoken relationships between authors in terms of how to do that respectfully, you know, and um, sure, sure. yeah, I'm, I'm just, I was always been curious about that. Well, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, there are some authors that are going to, to um, treat the characters with, with respect mm -hmm. and, you know, might run something by the originating author, even though there is no obligation to do that. Um, and then there are going to be some guys who just go and say, my interpretation of this character is correct. And, and, and they go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of in a unique position because when virtually all of the other writers came in that were going to be using characters that I'd created, I was the big scary dog. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't want to piss me off. And I literally, it was, it was funny. I was at, uh, uh, Lauren Coleman told a story about uh, uh, how when he wanted to write one of his first novels, he said, I want to use Sun Tzu Lao. And he was talking to whoever's doing continuity at the time. And that guy says, well, I, I don't know. That's one of Mike's characters. And, you know, Mike, not, Mike, Mike might not like it. Now, that makes it sound like, you know, I was watching over everything and I, right, you know, yeah. I had no visibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nobody called me up and said, hey, do you mind if we do this with Sun right. Tzu or, yeah. or things like that? So, <laughs> so, you know, but it was, but it was just very funny that, that you know, the impression had, had sort of percolated down through that, you know, you don't want to piss me off, which, by the way, is an attitude I do like to cultivate. I think yeah. everybody should know not to piss me off. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, but you, but you do have to be careful about that. I mean, my, my personal feeling is that if someone else has developed this character, yeah, I, I want to get that character right. You know, I want to show respect for what they've done. And you also, you don't want to crap on somebody else's character because that writer is going to have fans. That character is going to have fans. Yeah. And if you show that character a lot of disrespect, that's not going to be, you know, it's not good for you. It's just impolite. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of, running along that same theme, you know, how has it changed for you and, and writing in the early stages of Battletech where, you know, you're kind of, you're building the universe versus now in the later stages where there's so much more, you know, that you have to take into account, you know, and, and almost kind of, you know, similar question in terms of, you know, what is it like writing books in time periods that are sandwiched? by events that have happened before and after versus, you know, writing uh, books where the, the future is open-ended? Really, those are, those are good questions. I mean, and it was kind of fun. Um, uh, a year ago, September, uh, we had another one of these summit meetings with Catalyst. Mm -hmm. For the first time in forever, we had one of these summit meetings. And it felt very much the same as it always had. A bunch of, bunch of people there, a bunch of, they brought in a bunch of the writers. Uh, you know, Lauren was there, I was there, uh, John Helfers, the editor was there. And, you know, we went through and we were talking about where the universe is. So they got me caught up on things, uh, you know, what we want to do, where we want to go. And then it was just a free for all hashing out ideas and kind of, kind of scoping things out uh, as they go. I mean, obviously the pandemic and everything it's doing is, it's kind of slowed this grand plan down. Yeah. Um, but you know, that was still there and it was a lot of fun. It was and it, a lot of fun to go ahead and, you know, nail down a, a portion of the universe that, um, that you want to write in, nail down a corner of it. And it's fun to be, you know, knowing that I'm going to layer in these clues that are going to reverberate down through a couple more books. And then a year from now, I'm going to pick that back up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we'll drop the bombshell over there. Uh, yeah. So that is a lot of fun. In terms of um, writing when you're writing into the future or writing when you're encapsulated, um, it's not really that much different um, because as long as um, 
things come out that set up the other half of the future as you know it, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what goes on in this little box. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, when, when the history says, uh, you know, and the Kelhounds, uh, you know, got their heads handed to them on this world here. Okay. I can write the hell out of the story about how that happened. All that's important is that same result gets reported out. Got it. Yeah. Or an impression that that result is what gets, you know, if in the end of that book, the Cal on, on the world, the Calhouns are fine. And, you know, whoever's running the Calhouns is bribing the hell out of Comstar to report out that they've been devastated. Mm -hmm. You get the official history report. And yet, and yet I've still got stuff that I can play with, you know, further down the line if I want to change that. It, right. it really comes down to a question of how much creativity is the property able to absorb? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not only, you know, what the people who are running it think, but, you know, how important is this thing? Where is it in the continuity? How much more has been written? Um, and again, FASA has always been great about if, if creatives come up with ideas, you know, because it makes the universe that much more dynamic, they've been willing to go with it. Right. And, you know, going to those, those writer summits, you know, were there any kind of uh, stories or events that uh, could that kind of slip through your fingers or someone else got you and you were like, oh man, I wish, I wish that one was mine. Um, no, no, uh, no. As a, matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, in one of the ones, uh, someone was saying, uh, it was when it was decided that uh, 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 Natasha Kerensky had to die. Mm -hmm. They said, well, Mike, you can kill her. I just stood up and said, hell no, I am not killing her. I'll kill anybody else. Yeah. I'll kill everybody else. I am not killing Natasha. Uh, so, you know, so, so no, it was not a question of someone else getting something I, I, I wanted. It was, yeah. yes, this, let this, let this pass me by. So, so was, was that because Robert was brave enough or stupid enough to do that? I guess is, is the question. <laughs> yeah, I, but. I, 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 I can't speak to that. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, uh, um, I, I, uh, I, I have not inquired as, as, yeah. um, I, you know, part of the reason I didn't want to do it. I mean, one, I know that she's a, a character who's a fan favorite. Yeah. And so there's kind of a, a downside to doing that, but also I had really loved writing Natasha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I really enjoyed the times that I got to, uh, to play with her as a character. And I, and I, I, I did not feel that, I could do respect enough respect mm -hmm. for that character. I could I could give her the death that she deserved. Yeah, and to, so that's why I just didn't didn't really want to do it. Gotcha. Yeah, I know there's I know there's debate in the fandom about you know how how she went out, but I like it. You know, um, she's pretty old. You know, when she went out, so you know you, you can't live forever, especially in clan society. You know, the that's the, the hundred year old geriatric is is going to have a rough time in the political structure there. Right. 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 Um, but. Is, uh, by the way, I mean, the flip-flop of that, when, when I got to write Ghost Wars, um, this is why Victor was the only one of the young royals from, from the Blood of Kerensky stuff who had survived that long. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think, you know, back when Blood of Kerensky was coming out, everybody would have bet that, you know, Victor was going to be the first one to die. Right. The fact that he was the one who outlived them all, that was, <laughs> that was one of our own little, that was, that was something I pushed for, and that was, a, that was our own little own little uh you know inside joke uh yeah, yeah. about the universe awesome so. well um can you tell us kind of in the stories about you know you've had a lot of inspired moments in your books and and um you know are there any you know kind of going back uh that you know just really stand out of just you know you know maybe take us through a little story of kind of the you know you coming up with the idea in your mind you know any anything from you know, the wedding you know the infamous wedding you know to uh you know to you know and Actually, I'm going to take a little a side trip before I let you answer that. Um, I was, I've been rereading through the books and I'm up to Blood of Heroes now. And I read them through up to IMJ Falcon, actually, when I was a teen. And, um, and it was funny. I was reading through Natural Selection and uh, I got to, uh, you know, chapter and I started reading through and you were describing, you know, the assassination of Ryan Steiner. And I was, I was about a page of it into it. And I've got, I, I was hit with this flood of deja vu. Because when I was a teen and I read that, that chapter blew me away. You know, I think I read it like three times over, you know, because it was just so unique 
you know, in terms of how to approach it. And it's just, there was so much to it, you know, and basically what was 20 seconds of, of narrative, you know, brought out into this chapter, it was awesome. And, uh, and yeah, I remember, uh, you know, rereading that, you know, early, earlier this year, and it just suddenly I was like, wait, I've been here before. And it was such a, it's such a fun moment to kind of go back to and recall. And so I'm curious, like for you, if there's, if there's kind of, you know, moments that just really stood out for you that, you know, you just really love writing, you look back, you know, with a lot of kind of, you know, pride on what the project was. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are scenes in there and, and because of some other stuff that I've been doing, having to go back and reread pieces of the stuff. Um, not too, not too long ago, I had to reread, uh, the, the place where, um, Morgan shows up after returning from exile mm -hmm. in, uh, in Repost, um, and, uh, uh, you know, gets announced at the, uh, at the, uh, at the ball, um, that was a lot of fun rereading that, um, and, and, Apparently, uh, he says as he's choking up, has a lot of emotion, uh, just you know, built up uh, in me for some reason. Um, you know, the 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 assassination scene. I'll tell you two stories about that that were kind of funny. Is the reason I wrote that scene that way is that um, while I was writing that book, I was also reading Tom Clancy's *Some of All Fears*. Okay. And there is a place in the tail end or toward the tail end of, of Tom Clancy's book where he spends two chapters on the first 10 nanoseconds of a, a nuclear explosion. And it was, he had this novel that was just screaming and full of action and it hits a brick wall for those two chapters. I mean, I don't have a PhD in nuclear physics. I don't want one. Okay. Uh, and, and yet that's what I got for two pages. And so the next day I was sitting down to write that assassination shot and I'm going, damn it, you can do something that is highly technical and is not going to bore the crap out of the reader. And so that is why I, I did that and included certain details in there from reports at the time about analysis of, of JFK being shot and the way heads move and, and things right. like that. Uh, so I'd thrown that in there. The other thing, which is, um, the other thing which was funny was that I had a friend who at the time was working in the FBI and he had taken me to task for uh, uh, sometimes what he felt was gratuitous violence in some of the, in some of the books. And uh, I saw him at a convention and I was dreading his assessment of that scene because I thought I would get this same thing. And, and I, we were chatting and I said, so what did you think about, you know, that scene? And he goes, I thought it was great. That bastard got what he deserved. <laughs> so, you know, uh, <laughs> these things hit people in different ways. And, yeah. uh, and that's, all, uh, that's all good and fun. Um, you know, I think the other scene for me, which is, um, which is real, real powerful, is um, the scene where uh, Victor is, um, uh, I think it's malicious intent. Uh, Victor is uh, with Omi on Luthien, mm -hmm. and uh, the assassins uh, come to kill him uh, and kill her, obviously. And uh, uh, that scene, uh, I, that was a really tough one to write, um, and it's it's fairly brutal. Um, and uh, but I'm I'm real proud of that. I. I, I not, not proud of the fact that it's brutal, but proud of the fact that you know that was a that was a scene which hopefully would have some uh, have some impact and at least speak to uh, uh, Victor's character. So. Right. Yeah, that's a defining moment. Um, you know, looking at other other uh, authors, you know, and their stories. Are there any kind of favorite scenes you have? You know, from from other books, you know, in the universe. I, I it, to be honest. It's been so long since I've read a Battletech novel by anybody else. <laughs> my, mind, my mind totally blanks. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tend to, I don't have the, the luxury to read this stuff uh, for enjoyment because when I'm yeah. reading, it's always business. Yeah. You know, it's always, I'm having to analyze it and stuff like that. Um, you know, I do remember uh, back when, um, back a million years ago, they had sent me three novels 
uh, in manuscript. So it's just big stacks of paper and uh, by three brand new writers. <clears throat> and I read the th first one and there were, I made some notes, there were some errors and stuff like that that need to be corrected. Read the second one and there were some notes and I made, you know, things need to be corrected. Started reading the third one and I got eight chapters in and I, I stopped reading. Uh, and this was the first novel by Lauren. And uh, I stopped reading because I didn't need to read anymore. And I remember telling friends of mine, boy, if I ever stop writing Battletech novels, this is the kid who's going to take my place. Yeah. Um, you know, just because it was, it was that good. I mean, you know, Lauren, Lauren had it. He got it. Yeah. Uh, and so that was, that was very cool. Awesome. And, you know, you've certainly, you know, Battletech is what we're talking about here, but you've written in some, you know, a lot of different IPs, you know, certainly Star Wars being the biggest amongst them. Sure. You know, is there, is there a challenge for you in terms of bouncing from one to another and just kind of keeping everything straight or, you know, uh, you know, I guess kind of, you know, there's, you know, each of those universe have their own kind of rules and conventions, you know, do you find it challenging to kind of, you know, be able to kind of, you know, walk from one room to the next, turn off the light, turn it on in the other room as you're doing that? No, it, it, it's really not. I mean, it's, it's, um, if you think about it, it's like playing different games. You know, one, one night you're playing Cursed Court, another night you're playing Yahtzee, you yeah. know, and, and so they're all games. They have similar elements, but, mm. you know, it, it, the, the experience is going to be entirely different. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that as, especially I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm pretty good about uh, picking up on characters and, and how characters relate to the universes. Mm -hmm. So in essence, when I'm writing the story, I'm, I'm walking in the skin of a character who's already in that world. Mm -hmm. And that kind of insulates me from all the thoughts that they wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, and, and you had mentioned, you know, other games, you know, when I was reading kind of, I, you know, I was trying to kind of just do a little background research uh, earlier today. And I saw that you, you had been involved with Bard's Tale and that re reminded me, it got me another flashback moment when I was little of many, many hours in front of the computer, you know, in the basic little Bard's Tale walking around from city to city. Sure. It was a fun little, a fun little kind of connection to kind of oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. your work. But, uh, and, you know, just looking at thinking about games uh, from back in the day and now, and just kind of, you know, how much wonderful memories we have of the of the old ones, but how difficult it would be, assuming we could even get a computer to run one, <laughs> you know, to oh, kind yeah. of yeah. immerse yourself in the same way. Um, you know, do you, you know, you said you didn't have much chance to kind of, you know, uh, you know, read in the universe. Do you do you get a chance to kind of game? You know, are there various mediums, you know, in Battletech that you prefer, whether it's, you know, tabletop or role playing or video games, you know, assuming you have time to do that? Um, you know, I, I, I Basically, gaming, gaming is, or quarantine has changed gaming for me, and I end up doing more of it, which okay. is, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I live alone, but I have uh, friends who have a sort of, a, I, I'm included in, in, uh, in their quarantine bubble. Mm -hmm. um, we, we joke about, basically, I live in their guest house. There's just a 10-mile commute. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's a <laughs> big, long Big long, uh, big long commute. Yeah. But uh, a lot of what we end up, a lot of it, what we end up doing is is playing different games. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned um, Cursed Court by Atlas Games, um, which Atlas Games, it, uh, John nephew who runs it, uh, good friend of mine, and he was great. Uh, sent me a copy of Cursed Court, and this has been a, a a wonderful quarantine game because for gamers like us, there are elements that are, you know, kind of hardcore, mm -hmm. but for anybody else, there's not. And I, and I don't mean to be plugging it, but just as an example, I mean, that's kind of an abstract, uh, abstract game that we're playing, card games, you know, other, other board games um, that we've been doing. So I've been doing more of that, you know, finding games, bringing games over, you know, uncovering games that have been sitting in boxes and dusty in my, uh, in my storage room for a while. Um, and then I also do a lot of, I do a lot of uh, um, uh, computer gaming. Uh, you know, I play a lot of World of Warcraft. Okay. Uh, which, you know, I did a World of Warcraft novel. That was my introduction to Warcraft. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of stuck with me. So uh, yeah. uh, my, my goal is to eventually pay back to Blizzard all the money that I got for writing that book. <laughs> um, awesome. And I will get there someday. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking about many hours playing games when we were young, and and uh, Warcraft Two uh, was uh, was it Warcraft Two or the or the original one where it was based like a Sim City type of setup, but with uh, with the uh, um, 
with the humans and the orcs. I played I played much of that as well. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, in my teenage years, I realized that it was very important for the uh, my productivity, you know, and uh, relationships to step away from uh, games. And so I uh, I kind of have a very uh, tentative relationship with them uh, these days. So I don't play as much. You know, I haven't even had a chance to play the the HBS BattleTech or MechWarrior Online. You know, anytime since. But well, you know, I I think that I think that once you're a, a gamer, I think like as with everything else, you know, you, we, we all tend to go through cycles of things yeah you know you know it's there you know it's a safe haven you know you can go back to it mm -hmm. you know and, and when you need to you will it's the same way with books you know yeah. uh you know you like this author you will go back to that author you like this subject area you will go and read those things because it's 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 sort of the mental equivalent of comfort food yeah. um and that's a you know, that's, that's hardly a bad thing. Uh, you know, a little, you know, two, three hours of escapism nowadays yeah. um, is uh, uh, worth its weight in gold, actually. So Definitely. I agree. Um, and kind of go into, uh, you know, whenever I get comments and stuff on this, people always want to know favorites. And so, you know, kind of to appease them, you know, do you have a, the, a favorite character, you know, that you've enjoyed writing or, you know, a, a favorite Battletech novel, you know, within the series that, that just really stands out as one you enjoyed kind of working through? Um, I mean, two characters that I really, really loved writing um, were Victor and Kay. Uh, uh, those two, I, I liked how they worked together. Um, I, I liked the, the issues that they faced. I liked who they were and, uh, um, you know, as mainstays of the blood of Kerensky books and then mainstays of the universe, um, for me, they were a joy to continue to go back to. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, uh, I really, really liked them in terms of, uh, favorite books. Um, you know, I think, uh, Assumption of Risk is probably my favorite of those um, for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, you know, Kay was a, was a, a, a focal point, but also it was, uh, that novel was structured differently than I normally structure books. And so that was kind of an entertaining thing to go ahead and do. And I liked, and I, third, I think with that book, I kind of found a theme of, uh, you know, fathers and sons or fatherhood. Uh, and I normally don't deal much with themes um, when I'm doing books, but that kind of occurred naturally. Yeah. And, and so I just played with it there. Well, it's interesting to hear you use Kay's name because uh, up until this moment, I always thought it was Kai, you know, and kind of that brings me to the uh, pronunciation, you know, and uh, it's always up in the air. So, you know, do maybe a quick little trivia here. Take us through, you know, your pronunciations, you know, for kind of debatable things, you know, uh, let's maybe pronounce each of the houses. And then if there's any characters, let's give us the, the stack pole, <laughs> stack pole version of, uh, of how we should say this. And, uh, and people can take that as being as definitive as they Well, like. no, no, God, no, don't. I, I'm <laughs> to remember that everybody's going to pronounce it differently. Dialect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I will say this with, with, uh, K, the reason that I referred to him as, as K is, um, John Steinbeck, uh, did his own version of uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He basically rewrote Sir Thomas Mallory as, a, as an exercise. And Steinbeck's version, I, I like a lot. And in Steinbeck's version, uh, Arthur's brother, K, is not spelled K-A-Y, which is how he's spelled in most, uh, most Arthurian legends. Steinbeck spelled it C-A-I. And, and I just went with the, you know, changed the C to a K because I really wanted um, K to, and, and you can see it in the books, K is that sort of loyal stalwart backer for Victor. Hmm. Now that doesn't mean Victor is Arthur. That's, that's not that, but, yeah. but that was just sort of a reminder for me of what K was. But I, I've heard K pronounced all the different ways, K, yeah. Kai, yeah. Either one works, uh, you know, and, and he was such a nice guy who would answer to both. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, let's take it. So I'm not going to let you get out of my question here. So, uh, so let's go through the houses, you know, well, there's not too many Curita, you know, variations, but uh, Davian or Davian, which one? Uh, I'm usually Davian. Davian. And then Leo or Lao or Nai? Uh, Lao. Lao. 
Yeah, I just go with Lau, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, those are the two kind of question marks for me. What about uh, Daishi or Daishi? Daishi. The mech? Daishi, okay. Yeah, you got to remember Daishi is, is, is an American, me, putting together Japanese words. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that the Japanese would pronounce it entirely yeah. differently. Well, I should have ta- asked this question for Bob then. He would have been the, the expert on that one for there sure. There you go, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people um, you know out there. There's a lot of new authors coming in, uh, you know, to BattleTech, and and certainly a lot of people kind of writing fan fiction. You know, what are kind of like you know basic one on one tips for for writing in the BattleTech universe? You know, you know things that people should know and, and take account if they're if they're kind of aspiring to do this either on their own amateur, or, you know, get into uh, get into things officially. Well, you know, I think that that you know, whether you're writing for the Battles Like Universe or you're writing for yourself, Mm -hmm. um, what's important is that you uh, develop all the tools that you need to have. Um, Where I think uh, writing fanfic or writing uh, uh, unauthorized books, I think that's great if you want to do that stuff to learn how to write. Mm -hmm. But remember that if you're writing in someone else's universe, you're not doing any characterization. You're not doing any world building. And those are two massive pieces of being a professional writer. Mm. And all of these properties, and as you noted before, I've worked for a lot of different properties. Yeah. They're looking for people who bring more to the game who are going to enhance their property, not just service their property. Right. Okay. So, so you want to have all of those skills. Characterization. If you want to be a writer and have a career, characterization is the number one skill you have to learn. And it's out of the top five, it's probably one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So learn how to create cool characters, learn how to make them grow. Um, If you look at who Victor was, in the beginning of Blood of Kerensky. And then you look at who Victor is at the end of Malicious Intent. Those are two entirely different characters. Yeah. All right. That, that growth arc right there is something you have to be able to do if you want to get in. The other thing you have to do if you want to be a writer is sit down and write. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, there are, there are plenty of people out there who like to have written. They enjoy the thought of having done this, mm-hmm. but they don't actually like sitting down. There are some days when it is brutal, when you absolutely hate it. I mean, I'd, I'd rather be out tarring roads, you know, in the Phoenix summertime, okay? Because it's, it's awful. And there are other times it is a dream. You know, as I was saying before, I loved writing the Natasha Kerensky. She was, I mean, she was just a great character to write. Always knew what to say, could be nasty when she had to, and she could back it up. An absolute dream. Yeah. You know, Victor and Kay, they were a lot of fun to write. You know, they were, they were, they had a, a different motivations. They were emotionally vulnerable. They could be hurt. They had a lot of pressure on them. And, and a great chunk of writing about them was seeing how much I could heap on them before they would break. Yeah. And, and these are the things you need to learn to do. You know, Battletech is more than just uh, Kay gets into a mech and shoots the crap out of things. Right. Okay. We have to feel it. We have to feel that experience and we have to feel that character grow. Um, you know, I, I literally, I did a, yesterday over Zoom, I did a, two-hour seminar for Arizona State University for the uh, Piper Center for Creative Writing about these very things, stepping people through programs of this is how you attain these ends. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's just a lot of work. So, you know, prepare to strap in and, and, and work hard for a long time. And I was, um, you know, the, the last podcast I recorded, you know, two days ago, which we'll publish uh, right before this one, um, I was talking with a, um, an artist, an animator, uh, DC Bruins, uh, about his work. And he, he made a, a magnificent uh, little short um, video that's up on YouTube. And we were talking about that. And we were kind of talking about kind of the, you know, the legal side of kind of publishing stuff, you know, and so, you know, what, what kind of insights can you give people there? Because I, I know that there's, there's hesitation, um, 
you know, for a lot of people in terms of what they can kind of put out there in public, you know, as someone who's kind of worked with these companies, can you, you know, maybe give a, a little tips for people in terms of what, where to navigate what the do's and don'ts on the legal side are, um, you know, for I mean, kind of working on an IP? Sure. Look, I, I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Course, so yeah. let me really state that, yeah. state that up front. Um, copyright law is unbelievably strict but has a couple of exceptions, okay? Um, one, if you are doing stuff for your personal use only, like you want to practice, uh, you know, and so you're gonna write a Harry Potter scene that didn't appear in one of the books, okay? That's okay, you can do that, all right? The second you try and make money off of it, you are in a world of hurt. Okay, and a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these IPs, big companies have lawyers that if they find out what you're doing, they're going to send you a cease and desist. Yeah. Now, different companies have different have different attitudes. Some of them will look at a site where you upload fan fiction mm -hmm. for other people to read and critique, and they decide that's okay. Yeah. All right, but assume that that doesn't matter what they've done in the past assume that someone new got on the board of directors that day and all of a sudden it is death to fanfic day mm -hmm. okay and the earlier point i made is is also kind of critical because you can't sell this and because you're not developing all the skills you need to be a writer you also have to start writing your own original stuff. Yeah. Okay. You have to learn how to be a full service writer. So sure. If you want to practice, if you want to set a story, uh, in, you know, in someone else's universe, again, as practice, that's fine, but it's better for you to make your own universe and your own characters because that will develop you as a writer. Gotcha. And yeah, I know it's tricky for some because, you know, they have things like Patreon these days. And so the, there may be stuff tied to what they're doing with Patreon and bringing on contributors, but they might have other work that's out there and just, you know, um, you know, concern of kind of those two conflating and, you know, wrongly assuming that the work that's free to the public is generating income where it might just be, you know, a patrons, but, um, kind yeah, of know, look, you know, lawyers are paid to, to make you stop doing things. Yeah. Okay. If it's violating their client, violating what is their client's wish or what is their client's property. And ultimately yeah. we have to acknowledge that the way copyright law is written, whether you like it or not, um, I and my heirs own anything I create for my lifetime. And right now, 75 years beyond that. Okay. So it's not free for all ideas should not be free. Uh, you know, because that's just not how the law is written. Yeah. And if people don't like that, uh, please, God, go out and vote, you know, then talk to your representatives, mm -hmm. you know, and get them to shorten that to life plus 28. Yeah. The way it used to be. I mean, right now, if you were an author and you wrote something and you had the good fortune uh, not to die uh, before Walt Disney, if you have died, if you will, if you have or will die after Walt Disney died, right now your work will never go out of copyright because Disney keeps pushing, keeps paying people to push that number down the road. Oh wow! Yeah, because they have to protect the, they have to protect their property. Yeah, I fully understand it. If you don't like that, if that's not what you think should be done, then by all means. Talk to your Congress critters, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, vote, vote the people in that, that support your view and get that changed. Gotcha. You know, us creatives, you know, I may not like it, but one, it's not going to run out until I die. So who cares? Yeah. Uh, but, but two, um, if we're truly creative, we'll find other stuff to do. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll tell you one other thing, quite honestly, um, if, you want to write fanfic mm -hmm. go back to things that are already in public domain there are tons of things that are in public domain 
uh, there were tons of uh, detective characters. Um, you know, all of the Tarzan books are in public domain. Uh, there's plenty of things that you can go back and you can write fanfic where you're not going to be in trouble with anybody and you can turn around and sell it. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, just for stuff that I do for myself or for, for short story anthologies or things, um, I love going back and, and mining, you know, the characters that were wildly popular in, in 1895. Mm -hmm. I mean, there literally, there was this villain um, uh, written by an Australian writer uh, and the uh, 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 guy Booth knew, a guy Newell was his name, uh, but the villain's name was Dr. Nicola. Most wonderful melodramatic villain ever. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's all in public domain. And I just pulled him out and used him in a short story. There's a little cameo mm -hmm. mention and stuff like that. Yeah. But you can do more with it. It's cool. And again, you're playing in someone else's world. You're not going to be in trouble. You can sell it. If you're going to take the fan fiction route, if you want to be, it's like, Fan fiction is like riding a bicycle with, with training wheels. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. If you want to do that, there's plenty of material you can play with. Awesome. And kind of sh shifting out of the, the, the always fun legal discussion, you know, and yeah. something maybe uh, with uh, more levity there. Um, I'm, I'm, I love looking at, you know, uh, supporting artists as much as I can and calling in attention to them and enjoying, you know, certainly the artwork there. And, and Battle of Tech has lots of uh, wonderful art. Grant has some duds as well. But uh, I'm, I've always been curious from the, um, from the novelist side, from the author side, of kind of your relationship with cover art, you know, and kind of, you know, deciding what's on there, your perception of what eventually puts on there, you know, uh, you know, my impression is that you get little to no feedback, and it's mostly the publisher that decides it. But I'm curious, kind of, if you can just kind of chat about it because, you know, we've gone through stages. You know, there was sure. beautiful art in the early days, you know, with guys like Jim Holloway and uh, Jeff Lowenstein, um, and then it kind of, you know. It had a little rough patch there in the 90s, you know, and then, you know, it's starting to get, we're starting to get a lot of great stuff. And, and sure. for you, you know, you know, how much does that, how much are you involved in that or, or appreciate that? Or, you know, is it something you try to kind of just not focus on? Well, you got to remember that, that book covers, uh, the covers of any product are, are advertising. Yeah. They're a merchandising thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout my career, I have had book covers, which I absolutely love because they are the conception of what I think it should be. Mm -hmm. And then I've had book covers that I hate, but I also recognize, and, and with the exception of one of them, uh, those book covers that I hate are brilliant marketing tools. Mm -hmm. You know, they do all the stuff that they're supposed to do to attract readers. Yeah. There was a point, um, generally speaking, we get no, no real input on what, on what goes on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the best input a writer can have is you write a dynamite scene and they decide that's the scene they're going to get a, a, an artist okay. to do. Yeah. There was a point uh, when the books were coming out through Rock where Rock decided that they would ask the authors to suggest a cover design for their own novels. And I knew immediately this was going to be a horrible idea. Oh no. Okay. Because what author knows how to do marketing? marketing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, look, I worked in the gaming industry. I mean, I've done all this different stuff yeah. and I still know how much I don't know. And I knew from literally from word one that everything we as authors would suggest would be terrible for actually selling books. Mm -hmm. Turns out I was first one up to have to submit. <laughs> so I submitted a very exacting image of what I wanted mm -hmm. for the cover of this book. They decided to kill that idea immediately. <laughs> so no other author got asked, which was my goal. Uh, <laughs> that's too funny. Well, then do you, do you have, looking back, do you have a favorite, you know, of your, of your cover arts of which one that you just really kind of, you know, resonated with you? When you have when you have Boris doing covers for your books, yeah. How, I mean, you know, yeah. I could just die and go to heaven right there. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's you know, I, I, uh, I mean, honest to God, you know, that's likely to be on my gravestone. Yeah. You know, and he had Boris covers on his books. Yep. Uh, so awesome, awesome. Yeah, my I love uh, the Lost Destiny one. You know, kind of the. Uh, 
um, you know, between uh, Focht and uh, and Kerensky there. That's, that's my favorite. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Forrest. I'm the uh, probably possibly my favorite BattleTech artist. Forrest is uh, Day of Heroes cover or Blood of Heroes, depending on which. Uh, right, right. You go to, but yeah, there's there's this truly gorgeous art. I I, I wish um, you know there's some great art coming out now. It's very kind of battle oriented, but there's the 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 fantasy. <laughs> I guess emotion of those early pieces, you know, is uh, something I would love to kind of see come back. But uh, but yeah, Boris, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Um. Gosh. Uh, so you know, we're kind of in a, a whole new stage of BattleTech. You know, do you? Uh, is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to uh, moving forward? Kind of in these in this next, uh, I guess, evolution of uh, BattleTech. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, uh, the meeting that we had, uh, say a year ago, September, um, was, uh, uh, so that would have been September of 2019 or September of the before years. Um, the, uh, uh, I was really galvanized by that, uh, by that meeting. It was a lot of fun, uh, meeting other writers, uh, sharing the different ideas, figuring out what we were going to be doing and, and, uh, having stuff come together. So, uh, I was ex as excited about uh, what is a really ambitious publishing program uh, as I was, you know, back in the olden days. Yeah. Um, so I think it's all going to be very, very cool going forward. Wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. And it's not just because I'll have work. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun working with our other authors, knowing that we could build things to pass back and forth. So. Yeah. Yeah. All awesome. stuff. Um, we move we moved through Warrior very quickly and kind of you know started focusing on the kind of blood of Kerensky and, and the clan stuff and so maybe I can kind of pull you back to that and and kind of the the story development and themes and I know that uh, um, you know art ethics kind of theme kind of laid some of the foundation for what you kind of pulled into the Warrior trilogy you know and I, I'm um, I'm interested in kind of what were were your inspirations for the kind of those early kind of story points and how much. Um, you know, Williams and her um, writing had kind of kind of played and helped kind of helped give you, uh, I guess, a little launching off point uh, for for those stories. Um, you know, I don't remember because I was writing a, a fairly grand story, and I was having to cover a lot of turf. Don't remember drawing um, that much in the way of uh, direction or inspiration from those books that had gone before. To a certain extent, uh, when I read them over, I uh, analyzed them for content yeah. and for content mix um, to sort of get a sense of what I felt that the um, Battletech audience wanted and what they would tolerate. So that kind of showed me, you know, how to, how, what the fuel mixture had to be to make the engine go. Yeah. You know, I mean, I knew that um, you know, I, I like the fact that there was a tolerance for characterization. There was a tolerance for politics because that was it, politics was obviously going to be a big part of what I ended up having to do mm -hmm. um, with the with the books. Um, and you know, the Great Death Legion novels uh, show me what uh, what sort of combat uh, needed to be like, what the the readers were going to expect. Uh, and so I knew that I had to go through and 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 make sure that I was delivering on that end as well. And that's interesting. Bob had talked about that as well and, and kind of, you know, for writing combat and kind of the pitfalls of kind of, you know, getting it almost like a, a you're just uh, narrating a tabletop game and, and how that is, you know, kind of, you know, some authors are better than others at it. Um, you know, have, you know, is there, uh, you know, going back to kind of those tips for new writers, you know, what are kind of the strategies you take in terms of, you know, keeping your, those battle scenes, you know, dynamic, engaging without just, you know, this guy shot that guy and this happened. And, you know, you know, because, you know, people certainly kind of, uh, you know, love or hate the, 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 uh, the artistic flair that you bring into kind of the battles, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I love it because I mean I was like you walk around a walking nuclear reactor sometimes bad <laughs> you shoot at it bad things happen, um, but yeah kind of you know any tips or any things that you've learned along the way to kind of evolve kind of you know how you write uh, those scenes which can fall into a repetitive nature. Well, I think it's it's necessary to devote um, uh, some some thinking about how can I have a unique battle situation, mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, whether. It, 
you know, how does the, the environment, how does the climate play in, you know, what are the limitations going to be? I mean, you know, until I was writing stuff, um, there, I mean, I, I was the one that split out, you know, looking in, you know, magnetic resonance, uh, you know, looking in IR, looking in visible light, you know, et cetera, et cetera, trying to, trying to give it a lot of different dimensions of things that you could end up, uh, things that you could end up seeing. Um, so, uh, and that was, um, uh, it, that, that was kind of important to make sure that, that we weren't having the same setup all the, all the time. Yeah. I think it's also, um, important to, I mean, literally one of the things that I do just to keep it kind of fresh for myself is, um, I tend to roll dice and use the hit location charts okay. to determine, you know, what's going to be going on. So, yeah. you know, and, and then I end up having to deal with, uh, you know, deal with the consequences of that. You know, if all of a sudden a character is, you know, has a leg blown off, holy crap, it's, you know, their impression, because I'm, they're the viewpoint character, mm-hmm. suddenly things are going to be different as yeah. to, you know, how that result goes. And so, uh, so I, I kind of deal with that. I do have, and it ends up being a joke um, between Lauren and me. I have a, uh, I have a cheat sheet of about 50 different verbs uh, built up, depending <laughs> on what the weapon is. Okay. You can describe it and what effect it has. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Lauren keeps one cheat sheet and I keep not giving it to him. Awesome. <laughs> but, well, but if he, if he did his research, if he stopped worrying about running a business and he did his research, yeah, yeah, he could, yeah. he could extrapolate that from the novels. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but, it, but it's kind of, it, it is also important to, to, to make sure that you are using different words, yeah. you know, that it's not just the same, you know, the laser burned a hole through the armor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a missile blew another hole in the armor. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, we'd all die if, right. if that was going to go on. And I think, I think lastly, the, the most important thing, and it goes back to characterization, um, the damage done to a machine is not as important as the reaction of the pilot. Mm, yeah. you, know? Uh, you know, so you're blowing a chunk of armor away, yay, I'm making headway, or damn it, that's not enough. Or, you know, you bring that emotional content in there, and that just layers uh, a, a, another... Um, another way for you to get information in, yeah. uh, and that's kind of uh, that's kind of important. So. Awesome. And then, uh, then kind of a a famous scene. I, I, I'm sure the fans would appreciate kind of getting a little background of, of the wedding and uh, you know Hans and Melissa and uh, and the uh, the declaration of war. Um, and the the incredible amounts of chutzpah that comes with uh, comes with some of the activities there. You know, what can you take us through a little bit, kind of your, you know, as you were writing that, and kind of uh, you know, kind of what was inspiring you through, and and uh, you know, to, to kind of write that that uh, kind of pivotal moment. Well, I knew and knew. I mean, obviously, I think it was in discussions with Jordan and guys at FASA that uh, that the wedding was going to be the point where where all of this was announced. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, building up to it and, 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 uh, and, and, and I knew that, you know, I'm, I'm marrying off these two iconic characters, uh, that, that everybody was already in love with and, and, and those things. So, you know, I had to build that whole side up with it. Um, and I had just at, at that time, uh, about a year before my brother had gotten married, um, and I, I had attended a couple of other fairly fancy weddings. Mm-hmm. And so those were kind of in my, my, my recent inventory of memories. And, uh, uh, so it was really easy to, you know, kind of not lampoon, but, you know, bring those elements in and, and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, just going over the top with the China, yeah. uh, and, and all of those things. And, and, uh, you know, once you put all those elements in, you know, then it's like, how are people going to react? What's going on? You know, the, the idea of, of, uh, of Max running around collecting plates as if they were military intelligence, mm-hmm. you know, just that's what he would do. And yeah. uh, so it was, uh, it was just a lot of fun. It was uh, to, to, to go ahead and do that because yeah. it had to be solemn. And at the same time, you knew it was going to be the, one of those moments of, okay, the universe is never going to be the same. Right, right. 
Um, have you ever had a, a desire uh, to kind of go back and kind of write the early years of some of those early characters? You know, so like, you know, maybe some early Justin or, or some early Hans Davian or, or Katrina. You know, um, I know, you know, obviously I, I'm actually reading through Calhoun's Ascendant now I'm about halfway through. And so you've had the opportunity to do that for kind of Morgan and Patrick, you know, um, and, and certainly with, with things like Shrapnel, you know, and kind of, you know, adding opportunities to write short stories. So you're not even committed to full novels, but are there any kind of, you know, whether it's a Red Corsair, the original Red Corsair, you know, other stories that you'd be interested in kind of going back and revisiting from pre-3020, 3025? Sure. You know, with, with Shrapnel, I, I do have a, a serial that's going on that kind of falls up the, follows up the Callahan's Ascendant. Right. And then for Hairbrain Schemes, uh, I had done the novellas uh, for them, which are even earlier and sort of following mm -hmm. the exploits of a character who shows up as a member of the Callahan's. Yeah. Uh, later on. So that was a lot of fun to, you know, to be, to be pulling basically my cast of characters even further, further back in time. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, going back and writing stuff, uh, writing the sort of the fill in stories uh, is a lot of fun. Um, but it's also, uh, at least in Callan's Ascendant, um, as you'll see, um, one of the characters that I get to pull in is, um, uh, Hans's older brother, Ian. Uh, you know, nothing had been done with Ian. And so I got to play with him and, and sort of flesh out from the descriptions that, that we have. And that, was, and that was a lot of fun. I'm not sure, you know, originally uh, uh, I had pitched um, doing the uh, uh, Morgan and Katrina and Arthur Luvon Red Corsair stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that was going to fall into the line where natural selection was. But because that was going to go into the Rock books, Rock decided they didn't want a book that was going back into the previous history. Okay. They wanted to just keep pushing stuff forward from where they were. Right. Um, well, so at the time, I thought that that would have been a brilliant story to write. Um, now I'm not necessarily sure that I want to go back there. Gotcha. But doing the Kelhound Ascendant stuff, you know, we're playing sort of in that, in that era so who knows mm -hmm. yeah. you know that's uh uh that's one of those things that might you know discussions might come up and that might happen again yeah and if you know to plant the seed in your mind you know because you love uh, writing natasha so much you know i've always kind of been curious about kind of natasha's story pre you know wolf dragoons um with, with, you know without, without letting any cats out of the bag you may yeah. actually be seeing some of that so. i'm a happy man and everyone else can be too <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, on that on that note of kind of excitement, uh, you know, let me kind of you know wrap up here and and give a, a big thank you to to you, Mike. And uh, yeah, this is a fun kind of trip down memory lane. And I'm still trying to kind of uh, track down Robert Thurston, um, you know, and and William uh, to see if if they can kind of chat too. And you know, I told Bob maybe uh, maybe if I kind of connect with each of you separately, we can do almost like a. a organize a, a reunion round table and get everyone on for some for a group call and oh that would be amusing that would be that seems like it'd be fun even though i was i was very surprised when i was talking to bob and i mentioned uh you know a robert thurston that he had they'd actually never met um and so i don't know if you had a chance to, to meet him but uh you know i'm I, trying to think i think i met thurston once at a okay. at a show but only really in passing yeah interesting because um, he was bob thurston was a guy who had worked with um or a rocks editor uh, in the past um, doing uh, tie-in books. And so when they were looking at trying to figure out what they were going to front load, uh, Rock said, look, we got, we got Robert Thurston. How would you like to use him? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's how he was brought into the fold. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, well, cool. Well, I'll keep, I'll do my research, you know, and see, if, see what I can find there. But, uh, but yeah, but for everybody, you know, uh, thank you very much, Mike, you know, for, for kind of taking us this trip down memory lane and uh, kind of a little insight into, you know, behind the curtain um, of the Battletech universe. I really appreciate it. Well, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Wonderful.